In this lecture, we're going to learn about the production possibilities model. The production possibilities frontier shows different combinations of output for a specified amount of inputs. So basically, the production possibilities model helps us visualize the different possible things we can make given a set of scarce productive resources. So we have limited resources and we have to figure out how to use them and we can visualize the different possible we ways we can use those resources. Obviously, when we make more of one product, then we, as a result, have to make less of another because we only have a certain amount of resources to use to make the products. So if we want to incre increase production of good A, then by default we have to decrease production of good B because of our limited resources. And the beauty of this model is that opportunity cost can be calculated, it can be quantified. A limitation of this model is that we can only look at two possible products at a time, um, when in reality, obviously producers have many more choices than that, but this just helps us visualize opportunity cost. So this is just a table of data showing the production possibilities that are open to a farmer. Um, a farmer has a certain amount of land and this farmer has to decide how much of his land he's going to use to grow soybeans and how much of his land he's going to use to grow wheat. So you can see that if he uses all of his land to grow wheat, he can produce 65,000 bushels of wheat. And if he uses all of his land to grow soybeans, over here at point A, then he can grow 40,000 bushels of soybeans. And you'll also notice that there's not a, a constant trade-off between the amount of soybeans he gains when he gives up successive amounts of wheat. Okay, so the opportunity cost of the first 10,000 bushel of bushels of soybeans that this farmer produces is 5,000 bushels of wheat because that's what he's giving up in order to grow this first 10,000 bushels of soybeans. Now thinking on the margin, using marginal analysis here, looking incrementally, let's take a look at what is the cost, the opportunity cost of the second 10,000 bushel of, of soybeans and that would be 8,000 bushels of wheat. The opportunity cost of the third 10,000 bushels of soybeans is 14,000 bushels of wheat and the opportunity cost of the last 10,000 bushels of soybeans is, you can see here, 38,000 bushels of wheat. So our opportunity cost increased as the amount of soybeans produced increased. Okay, the opportunity cost went from 5,000 to 8,000 to 14,000 to 38,000 for each successive amount of soybeans that were produced. Let's take a look at what that looks like on a graph. So here we have point A using all of the land to grow soybeans and B, C, D all the way over to E using all of our land to grow wheat and we can see again on this graph that because there's not a constant trade-off or a constant cost for increasing soybean production because we give more and more wheat up for the more soybeans that we produce the shape of this curve is going to be bowed out any point inside the curve is going to be attainable okay for example if we wanted to grow 20 bushels of or 20,000 bushels of soybeans and 20,000 bushels of wheat that would be entirely possible but it would be silly it would be it would be very silly because if we only wanted 20,000 bushels of soybeans we might as well grow 52,000 bushels of wheat and sell it you know so any region any any um, spot in time inside the curve is attainable although it's wasteful because you're not using all your resources to their maximum capacity inside the curve um, any any point on the curve itself is going to be um, efficient using all of your resources and any point outside the curve is unattainable because of scarcity the pig principle won't allow us to go outside the curve okay so we can't for example grow 40,000 bushels of soybeans 
and 65,000 bushels of wheat um, given this plot of land. It's just, it's not possible. You don't have enough resources to do that. Okay, so as we just showed, this particular production possibilities curve was bowed outward because of the principle of increasing costs. And this is, is not something that's always the case, but in this example, um, this farmer was experiencing increasing costs. So again, the shape of that curve is going to be concave because as we increase production of a good, we experience increasing opportunity costs of producing additional units. There's not a constant trade-off between the two. And this is because inputs tend to be specialized and switching production can result in inefficiencies. So obviously some of that farmer's land was better suited to grow corn, some of that farmer's land was better suited to grow soybeans. All right, now the principle of constant costs simply means that as we increase production of a good, there's a constant opportunity cost of producing additional units. And the shape of this type of production possibilities curve is going to be a straight line because of the constant trade-off. Um, this is when resources are not specialized and product productivity is not lost when switching from one good to the next. Okay, let's look at an example here. If we have a factory that produces brown shoes and black shoes, um, then every time the company wants to increase black shoe production, let's say from zero to ten pairs of black shoes, okay, they're going to lose an equal amount of brown shoes. So we want to increase production of black shoes by ten. That means we have to give up ten pair of brown shoes for that first ten pair of black shoes that we produce. For the second pair of ten shoes or ten black shoes that we produce from ten to twenty we give up another 10 pair of brown shoes, et cetera, et cetera. Every time we increase black shoe production by 10, we decrease brown shoe production by 10. And so that's a constant cost situation. All right, this is an example I put in here just because I think it's funny. <laughs> uh, sometimes economists try to apply these concepts to your everyday life and sometimes maybe they take it a little too far because I don't know how true this is. But this uh, example is showing that your GPA and your leisure time um, can be demonstrated on a production possibility frontier. So the more time you spend on leisure activities, the lower your GPA is going to be. And I think we can all agree that's probably true. Um, but I think it's funny just how, um, how much you have to give up here, according to this, um, the author of this example. So this um, author says that if you want to increase your GPA from a zero to a 1.0, you have to give up 9% of your leisure time. You can still have 91% leisure time. If you want to increase your GPA from a 1.0 to a 2.0, you have to give up um, a little bit more of your leisure time here, 13%. If you want to increase your GPA from a 2.0 to a 3.0, you have to give up another 20% of your leisure time. So we're experience, experiencing increasing costs here for each um, point that we want to add to our GPA. And if you want to increase your GPA from a 3.0, to a 4.0, you have to give up 58% of your leisure time. So if you want to have a 4.0, you can spend 0% of your time on leisure. <laughs> yeah, right, right? Okay, so the concept of efficiency just means that we're not wasting any of our resources. We're using all the resources available to us. And that means we're producing somewhere on the curve. Um, inefficiency is caused by assigning inputs to the wrong task you know, using the wrong tools for the wrong jobs or putting the wrong workers in the wrong jobs. Um, unemployment, when we're not, have, when, when all of our workforce in the United States is not placed in a job, then we're producing inside of this nation's production possibility frontier, so we're not using all our available labor. And discrimination can also cause inefficiency in the workplace. But competition usually eliminates these inefficiencies. That's the beauty of the market economy. So, just in conclusion here on the little diagram, points A, B, and C are considered efficient. Points D and E are inefficient because they're inside the curve. So they are attainable but inefficient because we're not using all of our resources. And points F and G are unattainable. At this point in time, you would not be able to tell me which point A, B, or C was the most efficient. Um, at this point in time, we would just say they're all equally efficient because our definition of efficiency means using all of our resources. 
All right, so how do we get that production possibilities frontier to move outward? Okay, if we want to achieve points that are outside of our current realm of possibilities, if they're outside of our current production possibility frontier, the only way we can get out there is by achieving economic growth or getting more resources, okay? Either more natural resources, more labor resources, or more capital resources. And these are all examples of those that are listed here. Trade is also an excellent way to get outside of our current production possibility frontier, and we're gonna learn more about that um, in the next few days. So, when we uh, attain more resources, the curve actually shifts outward, the whole curve does, because with more resources, we are able to then produce more of everything. So again, to recap, a movement from one point on the frontier to another point on the frontier always results in an opportunity cost. The slope of the line representing the opportunity cost, I'm sorry, the slope of the line represents the opportunity cost of increasing the X unit by good by one unit. And any given point on the frontier is no better than any other point in terms of efficiency. Points A, B, and C all fully utilize the resources. So any point on the curve is equally efficient. All right, and that's a wrap.